get in and out of here. I don't have a whole lot for everybody today, so. But we, it's hard telling what God has in store for us, so. I think we're lined up center here, so I like to lean against that middle pole there. Anyway, glad to see everybody's here. Uh, again, thanks for being here in, uh, in Kobe's absence. Uh, I expected like have four people here today, but uh, no, I'm kidding. But, um, anyway, um, <clears throat> today we're going to just go over a few verses. And, and you know how Kobe teaches a book? Well, it's been so long since I've been on a consistent um, you know, day or anything like that, uh, especially with the, uh, my work and everything else that... Uh, I was beginning to teach the book of Ephesians quite some time ago, about two and a half years ago, but uh, we're not going to do that. We're just going to go over a few verses um, today that uh, uh, kind of st struggled around with, trying to figure out what I was going to do. But uh, anyway, uh, the first verses we're going to go over is in, in the uh, book of 2 Corinthians. So we're going to, everybody can turn to 2 Corinthians. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, first, and then 2 Corinthians. Uh, then we'll kind of, whoop. We'll kind of read over a couple verses here, and then um, uh, mainly our hub verse is going to be 2 Corinthians in chapter 10, and then we're going to kind of go off of that a little bit. And it, and it kind of ties into, I mean, really, everything that, the Bible ties together so uniformly. I mean, there's, there's really no division within itself. A lot of people say that there's, wow, a lot of people say that there's... Um, Contradiction in the Bible, when in fact, um, it, it, if there's something that appears to be a contradiction, if you study it out, it really becomes a gold nugget. It becomes something that's really, uh, it's just, a, it's just a needs. It just takes a second look, you know, or a third look to be able to decipher what what God's saying to you. And it's and as long as you're using the proper context, as we taught in in, in understanding your Bible or, or principles to understand your Bible, it's usually, as long as you're using the proper context and understanding the. Uh, the people to whom God is speaking, and the, and the timeline, and dispensation, and things like that that we went over quite some time ago. Um, if, if there seems to be a contradiction, there's truly not. Um, it's just something that's wonderful that's, that's there. But um, Kobe's been going through the book of First Corinthians, and in the book of First Corinthians, um, and as we know, actually the book of Corinth or the church of Corinth was was a church that was all you know kind of messed up on some things, and and it gives us an exampleship of of. Uh, okay, this is this is wrong, and then Paul always goes through, and God goes through, and says, "Okay, this is how you fix it. You know, this is how you make it right." And and that can be used inspirationally for us as a body, but it also can be used for us doctrinally, inspirationally as a, as a or I mean as a church, and then it can be used doctrinally and inspirationally to us individually about our own walk with Jesus Christ. And that's really what it's about. It's it's about our own walk with Christ. Uh, um, a body doesn't doesn't move along the same lines if everybody's going in the in, in different directions and and for us it's about being of, of one mind and one body and one spirit which is God which is Jesus and and if we can do that um, as all the books teach us to do is basically just to learn who Christ is and, and and what he means to each one of us and and not just what he means to each one of us but how much we each mean to him and, and when we begin to understand that, we begin to have purpose, um, we begin to have a plan in our life, and, and we begin to have um, a walk, you know, and, and the things of this world don't, don't seem as, uh, begin to seem less stringent and less, less uh, troublesome and less painful than they were before because uh, we have something greater than even ourselves <clears throat> and our own needs and our own wants and our own desires and our own imaginations. And that's what we're going to cover a little bit about today is our imaginations. Um, and we're going to go be in Second Corinthians chapter ten, and we're going to look at um, just verses, maybe three, four, and five. I guess we'll just go ahead and do three, four, and five. Second Corinthians chapter ten, three, four, and five. So I'll read these verses and I'll pray real fast, and then uh, we'll get in to see what God has for us today. So um, it says, "For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh." For the weapons of our warfare, or our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 
and uh, we'll go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for your truth, your word, as it's, as it's inspired by you, Lord. It's your, it's your breath that has given these words to us, Lord, and we just ask that as we read them today, Lord, as we read them any day, when we're in your truth, Lord, that, that uh, we accept them. We under, uh, you give us understanding through the Holy Spirit. And you give us remembrance and comfort in these words, Lord, that, uh, that we can survive in this world that we're in. And, and not, not only survive, Lord, but thrive and be blessed and, and, share, and be able to share those blessings with other people, Lord, as you uh, continue to grow and, and well up in us, Lord, that it spills over into other people's lives, Lord, because it is your kingdom that, that is greater than all things, and it's what we should be focused and concerned with, Lord, um, despite um, our own desires. And, and Lord, I just ask that... Uh, um, as we get into your truth, Lord, help us uh, every day that you help us uh, to conform our desires over to, over to you, uh, over to what your purpose and your plan is, not just for our lives, but for the lives of others. And Lord, just, uh, I, I'm nothing here. I, I don't even know what I'm saying. And I, and I just ask that, uh, that they be your words and not mine, because uh, I'm nothing and you are everything. And Lord, I just uh, ask all this in the precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Um, anyway. It says in verse in verse three. It says, "For though we walk in the flesh, in other words, Paul's just saying, you know what? Now, now the context. Let me just back up a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, Paul's just saying, you know what? We, we live in this flesh. We live in a fleshful body. This this isn't any different than what I'm teaching on Wednesdays, where it's carnal versus spiritual. Um, guys, the 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 whole book is about uh, yeah, a king and a kingdom." If you want to, if you want to wrap this up, wrap this book up in a, in a few words. It's about a king and a kingdom, and that king that we serve, which who, whom is Jesus Christ, is though he came in the flesh, he was a perfect being. He was God, and 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 though he sacrificed that flesh, that 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 final sacrifice, that that final atonement for all of mankind, that flesh was raised up and even defeated uh, death itself. But but God is spirit. God is spirit. God, God was before there was anything physical. God, God is uh, as, as all things will pass. You know, God has control of all things, and, and God is spirit. And spirit is very difficult to understand sometimes because we live in a physical world. It really is. And, and, and since we're in this flesh, you know, God says, you know what? Though we or Paul says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh. Because what Paul's stating here is that there's actually more that we war against than we're aware of. This flesh is difficult. This flesh has um, has problems. It has the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those are things that we have to deal with. All right. But there's also principles and powers and and authorities, you know, such as such as Satan and his and his wiles that are out there uh, also pressing in on us. So, so that's why in this context he says that we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. He's talking about the weapons of warfare spiritually. We're not talking about physical sense here. Okay? And, and it says, for the weapons of warfare are not carnal. Okay? Which means they're not worldly. Um, when, when we're tying this thing together, I mean, everything that Kobe says and, and, and I say, if it seems like it always lines up or what Darren says or what Brent or, or Jason or, or whomever's teaching or Tabby or, or any of you ladies, whatever it is, it always seems to line up, doesn't it? It always kind of seems to pull itself together. That's not something that we intentionally do, okay? That's not something we intentionally do. That's just something that's purposed in God because once you begin to identify God's nature, it doesn't change. It's consistent. It's a pattern. It's, it's, he's, he's solid. He's... He's the I am. He's, he's the unchanging, un, uh, un, unfathomable God. Okay, and because we're all in agreement, it just means that we happen to be doing it the right way. I think. Okay, and so that's why it pulls together. But um, so so if if what I'm saying today lines up with what I'm going to say on Wednesday, or or what Kobe says on Sunday, or whatever it is, it's because it's it's purposed in God that way. And if we're and if we're Leaning on the correct principles of understanding God's word, then it should come out that way. Whether it's Ron and teaching, or whatever you ladies were doing on Sunday evenings, or whatever, or whatever it is you do on your own time, if it seems to line up, then then you're in then you're in the word in the right way. And so I just you know want to throw that out there. If it seems like it's always going one direction, then it's because it's purposed by God that way. Then that means we're interpreting it correctly. It's not our own private interpretation, but it's but it's the way that God intended us to understand it. But it says in verse four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
No, and, and you know that on Wednesdays I'm teaching about quote unquote carnal Christianity. Okay? And and all throughout the Bible it talks about that th those things that are spiritual, those things that are physical, those things that are spiritual that are of God, those things that are physical are of, of the carnal nature. Okay, carnal just means flat out, if you look up any definition, it just means related to the physical, whatever it is, okay? Whether it's the physical body or the physical world. If we're dealing with carnal, we're dealing with those things that are of the world, those things that are physical. And remember, God was before anything physical. So, and, and it's usually characterized with having to do with the flesh or the body or, or anything that has to do with the world. And here Paul says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, which means that if it's not carnal, it is spiritual, right? And so uh, that's, that's pretty well presumed in a statement. And it says, but mighty through God, and that is the source, through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And strongholds are just things in our life. And if, and if you want to, that's a really good word study that you guys can do sometime. Just look up the word stronghold. And, and all throughout the, uh, it's mainly used in the, in the Old Testament, but strongholds were, were built. There were fortifications there for protection from outside forces. Okay? Well, in our hearts, we built up strongholds over time before we ever came to understand the spiritual things of God. And those types of strongholds, God wants to pull down. He wants to destroy them because it opens us up to God. And, and, the, and the more open we are to God, the greater the relationship. You know, so that's kind of the context, a little bit of what he's talking about here. So it's, it's the pulling down of strongholds. Now you guys can literally, through for verses 3 and 4, you can spend weeks just studying those verses, studying them out through the Word, um, just going from one verse to the next, um, all comparing Scripture with Scripture. Um, and and the and and I ask you to you know feel free to do that, okay. But again, this is a context, and the the way that we pull down the strongholds in our life, the way that our weapons of warfare are no longer carnal but spiritual, follows up in verse five, okay. So basically, he's talking about you know what we have a war in the flesh, it's not physical all the time, it's a spiritual war. It's 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 not carnal. You're not going to fight it with physical things. This is a spiritual warfare. You're not going to fight it with, with physical things. It cannot be done. It says the, the source, he says, but mighty through God. So there's our source. God, the spirit God that we serve, Jesus Christ, is the source. Okay? And it's done by the pulling down of strongholds, by the revealing of ourselves unto God, by that, like Susan was talking about a couple Wednesdays ago, where it strips off one layer and exposes another and strips off another layer like an onion, and there's another. And, and God begins to open us up. As everybody likes those like little onion blossom things, right? Everybody likes those deep fried things that you get. I don't even know where you get them at, but they're like awesome, and you like pull them off and you dip them in ketchup or whatever it is you love, right? And you pull them open. But... Um, I know it's a terrible analogy, but, but it's the only one I can come up with at the moment. But um, what it does is it exposes the inner core of that onion, right? It really does. Once you've cut it in certain ways, and, and, and it exposes it, and it opens it up, and, and it makes all of it visible. So, so that's what God desires in our life. That's what God um, wants in our relationship with Him, uh, with His relationship with us. And I mean, because guess what, guys? God is fully exposed. If you want to know Him, you can know Him. If you want to get to understand him, you can understand him. If, if, you want to get, uh, if you want to build a relationship with him, he is always open. He is always open. And, and we can, and all, it, generally our relationship with God is a one-sided relationship. He is always open with his arms out, with love and kindness and mercy and forgiveness and, and all things and all blessings. And, and the, the real problem is not in our relationship is never God, is it? It's always us. It's always us. And God wants to pull down some of those things in our life and, and, and so, that we can, so that we can be more exposed, so we can be open to Him and what He would have for us. When I prayed earlier, you know what? God has a plan for us. He does. He has a plan for everyone. And, and it's not a whole lot of different from anybody else's, but the main, the, the main part of His plan is, is coming to me, all you that labor and heavy laban, and I will give you rest. That's, that's the beginning of His plan. Once you start getting some rest, and you can start getting built up and strengthened and start walking out in some of the things that He's called you to do. 
But so how do we do that? How do we pull down some of these strongholds? How do we, how do we understand the warfare um, that goes on? If it's spiritual and it's not physical, then how, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to deal with that? In verse 5, it says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, believe it or not, I think it was like I don't know, 12 or 13 years ago, Kobe actually did a message on this actual verse. I'm not stealing his message, okay, because I can't really remember what it was, but I do remember how, how impactful it was to me at the time that he gave it. And he was doing, back when we were going through our ministry training process and, and we were having to go through the Word and, and pull things out and, and understand them ourselves so that we could give them out. This is one of those verses that he did on, on one Sunday morning before church. But it says, casting down our imaginations. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but I have a pretty vivid and pretty, pretty explosive imagination sometimes. I? I mean, I can be driving down the road and, and thinking, you know, God, you know, if you just give me, you know, $20 million, all the things I could do, right? Yeah, well, it turns out I have a lot of cars and a really nice house before all my imagination is over with, right? And that usually doesn't do anybody any good, and it's not purpose for God. But um, our imaginations can, can get pretty exciting sometimes, can't they? They can also be very detrimental to us sometimes. Uh, has anybody ever imagined the worst? Has anybody ever read that? Anybody ever heard that? You imagine the worst? Stop imagining the worst. You know, our imaginations can get in the way, whether it's in something that's, that causes us to live a false sense of reality, right, for, for something neat and wonderful. It can also get in the way that, that can cause us fear and turmoil and trouble. And, and, and these are just our imaginations. These are, are, are they, most of the time, our imaginations um, are, aren't really based too much on fact. You know, they're just kind of glorified thoughts that we may have that, that, that come to us um, because, because of our own flesh, because of our own carnality, because of, our, because of the world in which we live in, because of the things that we have to deal with. But God asks us to do something here. He says, cast our imaginations down. Casting down our imaginations. And that, and you're thinking, well, you know, my imagination's not that bad. I don't get run away with too many things, you know. I, tr I usually pull myself back to reality, you know, and start living a, a real life. Um, but here we get into a matter of, here our imaginations are something more than just a fleeting thought onto something wonderful or, or, a, or a fear, Okay. Imaginations can really get us into a lot of trouble because it's what it is is it, it begins to develop and, and, and alter our thoughts are what alters the way that we feel and our heart attitude towards things. Okay? And, and our imaginations, when, when they go one direction or they go another, um, they really need to be cast down. They don't, they don't need to be let go. They don't need to have free reign in our, in our thoughts. Okay? Because as we begin to let thoughts have, and, and this, this, I don't take me wrong, this is not some sort of like, you know, uh, you know, mind control or something like that. That's not what God wants. Okay, God doesn't want us to have, to be controlled robots, obviously, right? Or he wouldn't give us free liberty. He wouldn't give us the things that, uh, that we can, uh, a willing heart and a willing mind and a, uh, a free will. He wouldn't give us a free will. Okay, but when we're talking about getting our thoughts in line with God, and, and instead of allowing our imaginations to run with us, but, but getting conformed over to the, to, the, to the thought processes of his word, then, then our imaginations won't send us emotionally one direction or another. We can be balanced. Don't get me wrong. We're emotional beings. I understand that. But, but it's not going to be so out of balance that, that it's causing disruption in our life. Okay? Because what happens when we get confused? Right? We don't know what steps to take. We don't know which direction to go. Perhaps we won't move at all. We'll just stay in one little spot like a scared rabbit because we're not sure which way to go or which way to bolt or what to do. Okay? Our imaginations will generally get us there. That's usually what will get us there is, 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 is confused and not sure which direction to go because if trouble comes, our, our, 
I mean, I know it is in, in my mind, and I'm assuming that it is in most others, okay, especially when you've dealt with people for a while. Uh, pretty soon, when troubles come, man, the imagination begins to wander in all different directions. Troubles, ways out, resolutions, uh, fears, all these things begin to well up inside of us, our minds, and then pretty soon, uh, our emotions are taking over and all kinds of things like that. And when we get confused like that, when we get into those states, those states of being, then pretty soon, um, we begin to make judgments on those imaginations, on those thoughts, and on those feelings. Okay, I was going to go over faith, facts, and feelings again through the Word of God, um, but I chose not to do that because really, that's how to deal with it. Okay, but we need to understand what it is before you ever deal with it. And a lot of this is what it is. It's our imaginations, and what happens to our imagination is that that is timed. That is a time torn. Is that you? That's not you. No, I don't think it's you. It's the neighbor, and it goes off every Sunday. Yeah. So um, you might want to check it though. But anyway, uh, it's not you. Yeah. No. Oh well, shut it off. So anyway, um, it, they do. It happens every Sunday at a certain time. I'm not sure why, but it does, doesn't it? I think it does. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the one thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, guys, is our imagination. It exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and when we understand, when we get back into that that understanding of, hey, this is what God wants for me, then pretty soon our imaginations begin to die down, and we begin to focus on what God has for us. Okay, so our imaginations are something that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. It gets in the way. It causes disturbance. God is not the God of confusion. The moment we step into confusion, it's generally because our own thought processes have gotten in the way of what God's facts are for our lives. Does it make sense? Makes sense. Okay? And, and God says, so, so to cast down our imaginations, we need to do what? In the second part of this verse, after the comma, it says, exalt the self against knowledge of God, comma, and bringing into captivity every thought, every thought, to the obedience of Christ. Now that's 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 going to be a process. Okay, that's not something that it's just like I'm going to get up one morning and get on my knees and pray and say, God, I am giving you every thought. All right, I'm 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 bringing into captivity every thought. If it's against your word in any way, then I'm gonna you know I'm not gonna think it. You know that you know that's gonna, that's going to take some time, guys. We're talking about really applying God's Word, because one thing, you got to know God's Word in order to apply it in your life, right? So you're going to have to do some study. So the only way to get uh, your, your imaginations cast down and, and every thought into the obedience of Christ is to understand His Word. So that's, that's a personal thing that you've got to do on your own. You can learn some principles here. You can learn some guidance here. You can learn some, some, some neat little things that you can take home with you or you can talk to your neighbors about or whatever it is. But it's your personal relationship, that openness in Jesus that we were talking about earlier, that openness, that relationship that truly binds the flesh and the thoughts and can bring everything into obedience in Christ. And the only way to get that relationship is communication. We pray, we read God's Word. That's His communication to us. And, and, and through uh, the conviction of the Holy Spirit and through the local body, confirmation and counsel which we're going to start getting into that stuff later on down the road uh, for myself. See, I'm, I got the privilege. Kobe's going through a book. He's got to stay straight on the, on, the, on the margin. He really does. But I get to do all the fun stuff. <laughs> I really do. I feel bad for him. <laughs> I feel bad for him because I get to go, okay, guess what? We're going to go over counsel and what the body means and all this kind of stuff, and it's going to be really fun. But um, anyway, um, so, so let's look at another verse. Okay, so we understand that the weapons of warfare are, are not carnal, so that means they're spiritual. The, through the bringing down of strongholds, God is the source, and, and the only way to, to bring our, our thoughts and things into captivity or, or obedience to God is to cast down our imaginations and to bring every thought captive into, into the obedience of, of, of Christ. Okay, let's go all the, we're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament. We're going to go to uh, Second Chronicles, or no, First Chronicles, First Chronicles. First Chronicles. Now, this is going to be a bit to find it. I'll give you guys plenty of time, okay? Because you get uh, First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter twenty-eight, actually, I think. Yes, First Chronicles twenty-eight. Now it's going to take you. Like I said, you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, I'm trying to think how it all, how it all goes here. Uh, Joshua, Judges, uh, First Chronicles. No, no, First Samuel, First Chronicles. 
Now I've lost Chronicles. Where'd it go? After Kings. After Kings. Okay, first, second Kings, and then first, second Chronicles. Okay, thank you so much. Because uh, I forgot you got Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. Right. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Um, I, the kids at one point in time years ago had memorized all the books of the Bible through some sort of little cadence thing that they did, which is really cool. Um, I totally wish I would have done that myself. Um, but anyway, um, we're looking at First at Chronicles chapter 28, and we're going to look at verse 9. Now, the context um, to, uh, f while you're turning there is, is, is that King David, right, is coming to the end of his reign. Uh, David's going to die, basically. David's going to die, Okay. Uh, he had a pretty good run, even though if you look at some of the way David handled things, you would think it wasn't a pretty good run. But uh, according to God, he was considered a man of, of God's own heart. So, he, so uh, you know, God saw him as faithful because of his heart attitude. And remember that uh, last couple of Wednesdays ago when I taught, I said, you know what, most of people's condition uh, when it comes to self-idolization, as, as which David and, and soon his son Solomon will fall into, um, is that it's a heart issue. David pretty well had a, had a decent heart, even though he's, he made some bad mistakes. His heart towards God was always right. Um, but anyway, so the context of 28, 29, David's dying. There's preparation for the uh, uh, Solomon to take over, and he's getting instruction basically on, to, on, to, on to build, building God's temple. Finally, okay, because though David wanted the charge to do so, he, um, the, the pur it was purpose for, for Solomon to do that. Okay, that's what God purposed in that. And we're going to look at verse uh, First Chronicles uh, 20, 28, and we're going to look at verse 9. So i just kind of give you the context of, the ch of, of a little bit of this chapter here. And it says, and this is David speaking uh, you know, unto his son. And he says in verse 9, it says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Now, the only reason we really went to this verse is because we have, we have a number of things going on in this verse that, that are very, uh, very sort of crucial to that, to that 2 Corinthians 10 verse that we looked at. Because we understand now that our that our imaginations can get in, can get in the way, or at least a little bit. All right, if we can fathom it, then we can understand it. Um, and and that we need to bring all our thoughts into the subjection of Christ, or all our, uh, you know, to do that. All right. And here it specifically speaks of a few things. Okay, the heart, the mind, our imaginations, and our thoughts. And 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 all four of these things have to do with the inner being that we are, right? We all, we all are kind of made up of our, of our mind, our emotion, and our will. Because that's essentially what the, what the, what the human, uh, you know, the, the human soul is essentially made out of, okay? It's our mind, it's our emotion, and our will. And here we're talking about the imaginations, our thoughts, a willing mind, and our heart, which is our emotion. It's tying all four of these things together and saying, you know what, Solomon, serve him with all of these. You've got to serve God with a perfect heart, with a willing mind, because God searches all the hearts. If, if we think we're getting away with anything at any given time or point in our life, we are fooling ourselves, and it is a deception and a lie of the devil, and it's a deception and a lie of our own pride that we think that we can be getting away with something at any point. And I don't care if it's the President of the United States down to the homeless guy on the street or from a child or, or from uh, the king of all nations, which Solomon and David were the, were the king of, were kings of Israel, were the kings of kingdoms, were the kings of kings in certain points. Okay, so it doesn't matter your status. God searches all hearts and understands the imaginations of the thoughts. And, and I, I think this is kind of the key where it comes to why he asked us to cast down our imaginations. Why he asked us to bring every thought into captivity is because it's, it says what? And it says, and the Lord searches all the hearts, all hearts, and understands 
all the imaginations of the thoughts. So God's not going to ask us to do anything at all that we have that He hasn't. He understands His creation better than anything. He understands it, it is His very work. I mean, it is. Uh, it, it, if we look at the universe and, and all its wonder and all its glory, and you and you and you look out, if you guys can look online, anybody ever looked online and seen like a nebula and a and a supernova and you know all that, all these things and they're, I mean, the the coloration after they've done you know imaging work to them and things like that, like uh, uh, looked at the the X-rays and and done you know. Uh, uh, all the things to it to, to bring it to light so that so that they can study it so that scientists can study it and see all the different colors and 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 all those kinds of things and patterns in those things aren't they really the most amazingly beautiful things you've ever seen they really are it's like it's like the perfect it's like a perfect universe flower out there or something even even grander you know it's almost and and the size and scope of them are just amazing the skies and scope of them to me are just amazing and and I, I took it as not as what is it? Not astrology. Astronomy class. <laughs> I called it astrology once. My teacher was not happy about that. Anyway, I, I, I took an astronomy class, and, and you know, you had all these photos, and you could zip to different places all over the, the, the universe as well as it's known and recorded. And there's some really amazing things out there. There really are some amazing things out there. And, and they're, 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 all they're, they're all striking. They really are. They're pretty amazing. The thing about it is is those are creations of God, but does he take the time to love them? Does he take the time to care for them? Does he take the time to nourish them? No, of course he keeps it all perfectly in balance. He understands every molecule within every, every star, every, every atom within every nuclei. He, he understands all of that. He keeps it all in balance. But what does he love? He loves us. We're created after his image and his likeness. He knows us better than than anything. And he understands that our imaginations of our thoughts are going to be a problem. Because what, how, did, how did Satan attack Eve? With doubt, confusion, words, right? And what happened? He said, well, did God say? And he says, and basically he says, you know what, Eve, the reason God doesn't want you to eat of that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is because he doesn't want you to be like him. Right? This is essentially what he said? Okay. So what would go on in Eve's mind or anybody else that was told, if you eat of this, you're going to be like God? What happens? What's the first thing that goes on? Your imagination begins to take hold. Wow, if I could be like God. Wow, if I could be like even somewhat of like God. Then pretty soon... We're, and right then, immediately, we're in trouble. So God understands His creation. He understands that Eve, the, what Eve was going to go through, and He's telling. And and here, this is the most wise information that that Solomon could or that David could give to his son. He says, "You know what? Have a perfect heart. Be a, have a willing mind, because God searches your hearts, and He understands your imaginations of your thoughts. Okay, He understands them. If you just go over to the next chapter real quick and just flip over, and this is something I didn't see until later on, but um, he says in verse 17, it says, I know also, uh, in, in chapter 29, verse 17, it says, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and has pleasure in, up, in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered things. Okay, and he talks about you know, some of the things that he's offered over to, over to, the, to the tabernacle and to, the church, and, and to building the church. Okay? And it says in verse 18, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, of Israel, our fathers, Keep this for every, forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of the people. He's trying to guide him through something here. He's trying to say, you know what? We understand that there is an... I mean, David understood through the imagination, it affected the thoughts. And what's it say? In the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of the people. Now we've got not only are our imaginations going wild and it's affecting the way we think, but now it's affecting what? It's affecting our heart. 
and it changes our heart. It can change our heart in one direction or it can change it in the, in the wrong direction. And, and guys, when we begin to get, I mean, trust me, and I've, I've gone through this process so many times, psychology thinks they have it figured out. All they did was probably read first and second, you know, first Chronicles 28 and 29. Psychology says, you know what, if you change the way you think, your attitudes will change, and therefore your actions will change. And they're, you know what, they're right. They are right. They're just not giving God the credit. <laughs> because he came up with it thousands of years ago. Okay? Back when David was dealing with his boy. It's pretty neat, really. But, anyway, when, when, what happens when our imagination starts to take hold and we begin to think the wrong things, it begins to affect our heart, which is our emotion and our attitude towards things. And then, and then where are we? If it's, if it's on the negative side. But, but if we begin to feed our mind with the Word of God, right? If we begin to cast down our imaginations and bring into, into captivity every thought that we, can, that we can have according to God's word, now what does that affect? That also affects our heart attitude for a different way. It also changes our actions towards people that we love and that we care about, and, and people that we don't, and people that we just meet, or people that we run into, or such as, or as, as Tanya, as people that we work with, Right? It should be spilling over like that. When we begin to get those things to captivity, uh, we begin to bring those thoughts into captivity into Christ. In other words, what we're doing is we're replacing our thoughts with God's thoughts. And it begins to change us. And uh, if we go on in verse 19 in, in 1 Chronicles 29, it says, And give unto Solomon my son a perfect heart. Now this is David's prayer. And give unto my son Solomon a perfect heart. To do what with? Now the only way to come up with a perfect heart is to do what? Keep our imaginations, our thoughts, onto God and what His plan and His purpose, what His words are. Because it's the thoughts of our heart then that we're concerned about. And he's saying, and he's and David's saying, you know what, God, please give my son Solomon a perfect heart. Why? So that he can keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes. And to do all these things. And to build the palace for which I have made provision. So, uh, guys, if it, there's nothing greater that will build a church, and inspirationally, now, 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 this is actually historically what was going on, all right? But David inspirationally knew that there were some things that has to go on in the hearts of man. He understood it because he'd lived it. He understood it because he had to deal with his own thoughts, his own fears when he was being chased and held captive and, and, and being run down like a dog. Um, It'd be pretty easy. I mean, I, I don't know if I, if I had an entire posse of, of the king's men looking to kill me, and I was running from house to house and living in caves, could you imagine how intently your imagination, every cricket chirp I would be thinking was a soldier? Do <laughs> you, you understand? You see what I'm saying? He had to go through some processes. David understood that your imagination can get away with you. And when it does, your thoughts will follow and your, and your actions will follow and your heart attitude can get pretty slumpy over time. Okay? So he understood this. And so God got him through that. God gave him words. God gave him encouragement. God gave him those things to help feed him and nurture him so that he can move forward. And, and what did David do? He applied those. He remembered what God said. If you read the story of David, it's really cool. He understood what God said. He believed it. And it changed his heart about everything that God was doing. Every single time he felt in danger. Okay. Is God any different today for any one of us? No, he's not. No, he's not. So he's asking, you know what, God, just give my son a, a perfect heart and keep thy commandments and thy testimonies, or so that he can keep thy commandments and thy testimonies. Um, now, I was going to kind of go in. There's, there's a number of verses um, on imaginations, on, um, on heart, guys. Uh, uh, there's a lot of them available. If you ever want to read them, just, just dig in there and look up the word imagination, and then there's a word imaginations, um, plural. Um, there's a word thoughts. I mean, there's so many verses on these guys. There's so many verses. I wish I could give them all to you. 
I mean, there there's so many. Um, the thoughts of the heart. You can look up those specific phrases. They're all through the Bible. Because God understands that we are a being that He created. We're mind, emotion, and, our, and we're will. And He's given us provision to do that. One way to, to help us along is, is, is back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 again. Is where He says, um, cast casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the God, knowledge of God. Because once our imagination takes, takes over, then we begin to forget, forget about what God has said. That's the knowledge of God. We begin to forget that. And we don't need to do that. So that's why he's asking us to cast us down and bring into the captivity our thoughts. Okay? Um, if, I think if I go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'll just read it to you. It says, For if there be first a willing mind... It is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to them that he hath not. So it takes a willing mind to be able to, you know, say, "Okay, God, I have that willingness. I'm going to do that. I'm going to. I'm going to. Do, I'm going to. I'm going to bring into. The, I'm going to do everything I can, Lord, to have that relationship with you." Okay, in Romans verse one, uh, or in, in Romans chapter chapter one, verse twenty one, it says, "Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful." but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Okay? When we begin to become vain in our imaginations, and we don't cast down those, those things that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, vanity becomes to become... Because guess what? I can say, well, I can take care of this. I can do this, and you know what? God blesses it because perhaps your heart attitude towards it was right, but then you don't give God the glory of it, and you say, wow, man, I really worked that thing out. I really did that. What happens? I can do the next thing just as well as I did the last. I did it. I can do it. I can do it again. That's our nature. That's our nature. Okay? Why? Because we're created in the perfect image of God. We are not the perfect image of God, but we were created in it. That's where we get. That's where our mistakes come in. Because we are humans. Because we have authority over all things. Because God has given us authority over all things um, in this in this world. Well, you know what? We can we can walk onto a, a plot of land and completely change everything. We can change everything. We can change the the the. We can. Uh, change the geography of it, we can change the landscape, we can, we can affect the, the, uh, the, the animals and, the, and you know, everything, I'm trying to think of the words, they're completely eluding me, but we can completely change something if we want to, because God created us where we're just outstanding, we're outstanding, we're the most outstanding creatures on this planet, but guys, we're really not capable of anything when it comes to spiritual. It all comes from God. So God's the source, and, and because they were not thankful in verse 121, they began to become vain in their imaginations, and it darkened their heart. <coughs> Guys, we have to understand that it's our, our imaginations and our thoughts that affect our heart attitudes towards God, because it says, and their foolish heart was darkened. In verse 22, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So we need, to, we need to make sure that we're having those imaginations, cast them down. The only way to do that is by the source, understanding that there is a spiritual battle, understanding that, that God is the source, and the, and the way that he wants us to do it is to submit our thoughts and our ways unto his word so that we can understand his statutes, so that we can, uh, just, just, as Solom or just as David wanted for Solomon, that he can... You know, adhere to his statutes, understand his commandments, you know, submit himself over to God because that is the greater purpose. We, we've got to do it. We've got to do it. And guess what will happen, though? Did Solomon build that temple? Somebody help me. Solomon built that temple. And he built it exactly the way that God wanted it. We are our own temple. God wants to build us exactly the way he wants us to be. The only way to do that is to follow him and to, and to submit ourselves over to his commandments. That's all I got for today. We'll go ahead and close out in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for your truth. Lord, thank you for your love and the peace that you provide, Lord. And, and Lord, where does peace come from? You are our peace. 
The Word says that Jesus, that Christ, is our peace. Lord, without it, how, how do we function? How do we do it? We don't. Not the way that you would intend us. And Lord, when our imaginations begin to run wild, we no longer have peace. We no longer have what we need. But Lord, help us to understand your truth. Help us to reign in ourselves. Lord, help us to bring about our thoughts into captivity. And Lord, this isn't mind control. You're just doing it because you love us as children, just as David loved his son Solomon. He wanted him to have peace and, and to live by your statutes and your commandments and have a pure heart. Lord, how pure is our heart when we're thinking vain thoughts? How pure is our heart when we, when we get into your word and, and we're looking for something for ourselves according to our own imaginations? thoughts Lord it's, it's it, we understand we're sinners we, under, we understand we fail but Lord we can have peace through repentance through the blood of Jesus Christ and then we can continue in that peace by living according to your word by reigning in our imaginations by casting them down and by bringing our thoughts over to your truth Lord, we can't operate on faith without it. We're operating on ourselves if we're not. So, Lord, I just ask that uh, you be with each person here today, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of, of your truth, for the gift of your Holy Spirit that resides within us, and for the body that helps us get from point A to point B spiritually and sometimes physically. Lord, thank you for each member here that has a study on their own. They affect people on their own. Lord, we're all going the same direction. And that's where other people can come along and see and they can hop in and say, you know what, I think I'll take a ride with you because it looks like you're going to go someplace. Lord, help us get there. Keep building us up. Keep strengthening us. Keep edifying us. Keep comforting us. Keep loving us as only you can. And I just ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.